Um, I'd like to welcome you all here, um, both those of you in the room and those of you who are joining us on Zoom. A lot of the Zoom attendees are coming in via certain libraries around the state, so we're very grateful for their participation too. Um, I just want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, the traditional owners of the land that the State Library sits on. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, um, especially the State Library and the City of Sydney and Create New South Wales, without whom we quite literally wouldn't be here. They've, um, they've helped us establish the festival now. This is our fifth one, so I think it's, um, it's up and running at last, which is fantastic, but we couldn't have done it without their help. My name is Michael Duffy. I'm a, a crime writer and a founder of BAD, and we're joined today. We're going to talk about the nominal subject of Sydney and crime, but that's really only an excuse to talk to re two really interesting crime writers, I think, about a much more varied range of subjects. Um, <laughs> Chris Hammer here is um, a best-selling author that most of you would know. Um, you may not know that we're going to award him our Danger Prize this year. We give a prize every year for the best work from the last financial year about Sydney and crime. And his wonderful novel, Trust, is the winner of that. Uh, and his latest novel, I should say, Treasure and Dirt, has been described by some critics as, as even better, as his best book ever. So get that one too, if you haven't yet. Richard Beasley uh, is the author of Hell Has Harbour Views that was both you know, a bestseller, but also an ABC TV show that some of you may have seen. He's also written two novels about a defence barrister named Peter Tanner, um, which are pretty fabulous. And we'll be talking a little bit about them in a moment and why it may or may not be a good idea to have a, a defence lawyer as a protagonist in a crime novel. But can you join me now, please, in welcoming our two guests? I want to start at a bit of a tangent. Um, Although we invited Richard and Chris because they've written what I regard as some of the best crime novels set in Sydney, it's also a fact that each of them has written a non-fiction book about the Murray-Darling river system and what we have and haven't done to it, which may lead us into the subject of crime anyway. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Chris's The River was published in 2011 and Richard's Dead in the Water was published just this year. And... Um, they're both available in the bookshop and I recommend both of them if you haven't read them. Um, I just want to ask each of you two questions before we move on to onto the fiction. Chris, what drove you to that particular subject? I think this was your first book, wasn't it? The book, The River? Yeah. Um, I was working uh, as a senior writer for The Age, but based in the press gallery in Canberra. And one of my rounds was the environment. So this isn't about 2008 and that there were two big issues if you're an environment writer climate change and uh, carbon trading and what to do about the river system and wow haven't we advanced so much in the years <laughs> since you know, if i was still doing that job i'd still be writing the same stories one of the frustrations about um it, it was at a time john howard had, had tried to bring in a, an overarching plan for the Murray-Darling Basin, put $10 billion on the table and essentially failed because constitutionally the states have the power over the rivers and the Victorian government didn't agree. So when Kevin Rudd was elected, they retried and, and you know a few billion dollars more and they got there. So there's all these arguments, all this debate about how this new river plan should work but it was very much a debate amongst interest groups. It was quite arcane. It was all about gigalitres of water here and catchments there. And as a journo, I found it really hard to make sense of it and to make it interesting to readers. So anyway, I had an opportunity to write a book. And so the river is, it's, it's not a kind of forensic examination of the river system. It's actually more like travel writing. You know, they call it narrative nonfiction. I always love travel writing. So I travel from the headwaters of the Murray Darling in Queensland all the way down to the lower lakes, right at the height of the millennial drought, where, where you know, there was massive desperation. And if any of you have read my first crime fiction book, Scrublands, that's where I got the setting from because I spent a week out in that in an irrigation town that had no water. <laughs> 
So that's the that was the genesis of that book. Yeah, and we might talk about the, the relationship to scrublands later on. Um, Richard, um, Richard's book on the same subject, 10 years later, an interesting 10 years is subtitled A Very Angry Book, and it's certainly got more swear words in it than Chris's. Uh, Richard, what brought you to the subject? Uh, I spent 13 months of my life as senior counsel assisting a royal commission into the basin plan where um, uh, the commissioner was a, a barrister called Brett Walker, who's uh, uh, one of Australia's leading barristers. And um, we were looking into a, whether the basin plan fundamentally was lawful, either as a matter of law and as a matter of fact, and also whether it was working. Um, Brett's findings in that Royal Commission were that the, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, which is the Commonwealth Authority that's in charge of drafting and then implementing the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is an organisation riven by maladministration, gross negligence and incomprehensible decision-making are some of his findings. What, in, in essence, we found was Howard's Act is a fantastic act, the Water Act, which was passed in the dying days of Howard's government, where he actually briefly converted to believing that climate change was happening. He passed a law in the Commonwealth um, Parliament, or Parliament did, which said, look, we've, we're damaging this entire system, which is twice the size of France, nearly twice the size of France. We're ruining the environment by over allocation of water for growing food and fibre. We're not going to go back to 1788. We're still going to have food and fibre grown in the Murray-Darling Basin. Still going to have rural towns that, for those people that depend on water to make money, they're still going to be allowed to do that. But we're going to stop at the point where we start killing the thing, which seems pretty reasonable, but um, interest groups and people that own a lot of water didn't fancy that idea. Um, and in the end, the Basin Plan was designed to achieve this, to achieve a, a balance between having water go to irrigation and growing things, but stopping at the point where we don't kill the system. And the Basin Authority just didn't draft the Basin Plan that way. You don't need to rely on me for that. I called countless expert evidence, hydrologists, river experts, lots of different ecologists, climate change experts who all said that the amount of water that's being returned to our environment um, from irrig ir irrigated uses and other consumptive uses is not enough to save the system. Yes, this year it's rained, but in the, the long-term average um, is that we won't save this system. It'll die from the mouth up. It is dying from the mouth up, from the Coorong up. There's lots of other stress points in the system. And instead of admitting what they've done, the Basin Authority have said, no, we do have this science-based plan, but it, it, it's actually rubbish. It's not a science-based plan. The amount of water that's going back to the environment, which was under the Water Act, meant to be determined only on the basis of best available science, was in fact a political fix. So we called ex-employees at the MDBA who said, the figure that's get, amount of water going back to the environment is not determined by science. It was a political fix between various water ministers and public servants. That's disgraceful enough. But while the plan was being prepared and, and the decision was being made about how much water goes back to the environment, a leading scientific organisation, the CSIRO, told the Basin Authority, look, whatever you do in deciding how much water has got to go back to the environment, you must include climate change projections in your modelling because even as far back as 2008, 2009, the CSIRO was saying there'll be wet years in Australia and dry years in Australia because we have a variable climate in the basin, but the long-term trend is hotter and drier and for each one degree C, the temperature goes up in the basin, we're going to lose 15% of water. So you can imagine two degrees, 30% less water than historical averages. Basin Authority's response to the advice from our leading scientific organisation was, thanks very much, no, we're not going to do that. CSIRO writes back to them in about 2009, says, unless you do this, this, this is, quote, scientifically indefensible. And the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, who in charge of, Chris mentioned $10 million, is actually $13 million of taxpayers' money Billion. Getting, getting advice 
from our leading scientific organisation, this other Commonwealth entity says, we are going to ignore that advice and we're not going to put in climate change projections into our modelling. That's one of the things that Brett, as you can probably understand, found to be disgraceful, grossly negligent and incomprehensible to his thinking that one Australian government entity with so much of our money to spend can just ignore entirely what climate change experts are telling them they need to do. So the whole thing has been, has been um, infected by this, this lie of dressing something that's politics up as science. And as, as a lawyer, that really offends me. I, I think public servants and politicians should be honest. If, if a science-based plan is, <laughs> call me naive. It, but if a, if, if, a, if a plan is meant to be science-based and that's too much for politicians to deliver, fine, admit that and say, we can't, we can't, can't give you a, a, a Rolls-Royce basin plan. We can only give you a, 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 a B-grade plan. But be honest about that. Say it's not politically deliverable. Don't lie and say something that's actually politics is science. And I think that's what I found and still find the, the most aggravating thing about what I learned in the, the Royal Commission. Okay. Um, we're going to allow 15 or 20 minutes for questions at the end, so we we'll, might return to the subject then, but we have to move on to fiction now. Um, speaking of which, if you think your eyes are letting you down, that's not a photo of me up there. It's actually someone else. Um, sorry about that. I don't know who it is. It's not, um, it's not actually Tim Aylip. I've no, got no right. idea who so it is. Uh, no, as I've said, it's, 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 it's rather an old photo of me too. But The mystery, <laughs> the mystery continues. But on to other things. Um, Chris, um, each of your novels is set in a different part of New South Wales, largely. Um, so we can't certainly classify you as a Sydney writer. Have you ever actually lived in Sydney? Oh, no, I've lived here a couple of times. I, I, I grew up in Canberra and I live in Canberra now. Um, but I lived in um, uh, I lived in around Newtown, Darlington for a year and a half in the 80s. I worked at SBS. I lived in Glebe. I lived in Bondi. I lived in Double Bay, sort of through the 80s and 90s, sort of bouncing between there and Canberra and travelling internationally as a correspondent for Dateline. Um, so I'm uh, I'm reasonably I'm I'm a lot more familiar with Sydney, say, than I am with Melbourne or any other you know state capital city. So, yeah. Okay, but you sort of come from outside. Any thoughts on on how you see the place especially as as a setting for crime so look my, my view is that setting is really important in crime fiction but it's essentially in any fiction because it's much more than a geographic location um, with my other three crime books they're, they're set in real landscapes but in fictional towns whereas when i wrote uh, trust of I wasn't going to make up a fictional city of 5 million people or something on the east coast of Australia because people would just say, oh, it's, a, it's meant to be Sydney anyway. Um, and, of course, the, the book's about, you know, political intrigue and crime and corruption and casinos and dodgy high-rise buildings. And so we're, we're better to set it than Sydney, right? Um, but the book, a book is more than just, the setting's more than a geographic location in that what you're really doing is creating a, a world and inviting the reader in. So when you pick up the book to read it, you're leaving your normal life, even if it's in Sydney, even if it's in the streets that that book has set, and you're entering a kind of an imagined world or a reimagined world. And if you think, say, of all the books that you've read that have set in, say, London or New York, okay, it's a real place, but the books can be vastly different, you know, from, you know, Breakfast at Tiffany's to Bonfire of the Vanities to, you know, whatever, you know, from comedies to tragedies to dystopian futures, whatever. It's a reimagined sort of place. And if you get... If you get, you know, it, it, it's best it can be something like, you know, Lord of the Rings, where it really is just totally imagined. But even with a real city, so you can write, you could write very different views of the same place. So in my book, Trust, 
deliberately. It's not tourist Sydney. There's no harbour. There's no bridge. There's no Bondi. There's none of that. It's all sort of set loosely around sort of Surrey Hills, Central Station. But it's it's a rather grim sort of situation. It's, it's sort of set post-COVID and the economy's not doing so well. And, of course, that sort of area of Sydney was once pretty gritty, right? But if you go now, it's in, so gentrified. It's, you know, try buy, you know, try buying a house in Surrey Hills or something or, or you know, Redfern. Um, you know, when I lived in up, I used to catch a train down at Redfern Station every day and it was a pretty wild and morning place back in the, in the 1980s. Um, so setting is very important and the real city is just the starting point. That's where you go from there that's important, I think. Does Sydney, looking at it from the outside, as it were, have a character for you or is it just, it's just like the rest of Australia but kind of bigger and more varied? Oh, no, I think there, there really is dramatic differences between, I think, all the state capitals. Um, and, well, in, I live in Canberra, but, of course, Canberra is possibly the weirdest city in, in Australia, <laughs> the most unnatural city. Just in my mind, Sydney is, like, different, even different colours than Melbourne. Melbourne is green and grey and Sydney's blue and white, which is a bit, you know, it's a bit clichéd, but it's that that's there. It's... Um, Melbourne is, is probably, you know, a more inside city, you know, so Sydney's more outside. Uh, it's probably a bit more hedonistic. And it seems for, for crime, it, it really, uh, of all the cities, it seems to have the longest history of that kind of criminal class that sort of permeates the city. And and I've heard, I heard someone not recently described it as saying that Sydney is still in some ways a colonial city. And I thought that was, you know, it kind of rang true to a sense that some of the, the mentality has continued on through, through the decades and the centuries of, you know, of, of the rum core or, you know, the, the razor gangs or, you know, whatever. So, no, Sydney is the perfect place to set any kind of crime fiction, I reckon. Uh, any... any novels, previous crime novels, or even novels generally about Sydney that, that stick in your mind? Um, oh, yeah, look, look a lot. Even, you know, things like Christina Stead and, and, and going back to those uh, sort of books. Um, you know, Oscar and Lucinda, there's some great sort of scenes set there in, in early Sydney. Um, and, yeah, Peter Corris, of course. Um, and... and it seems though that you know the crimes have moved, crime books have moved away a bit from the you know the mean streets and the big crime bosses that a lot of I think crime writers tend to pick up a bit on what's of concern in society at the moment. So our concern at the moment isn't focused on you know the mafia or this sort of Abe Saffroni sort of figures that. That, that were so prominent, say, back in the 60s and 70s. And now, say, you've got a lot of books that are addressing issues such as uh, domestic violence, um, you know, post Me Too. So, so, so I think there is this tendency amongst crime fiction authors, not deliberately, not in a calculating sort of way, it's kind of what's, what's unsettling people at the moment. So, you know, a couple of decades ago, it would have been serial killers. Right, so it's sort of like what vaguely what's in the air at the time att attracts you. But Sydney, there is always there's always this uh, suspicion of high level corruption in politics, in casinos, with drugs, whatever. So it's it's always there. Okay, thanks. Richard, you grew up in, in Adelaide, which has a perfectly respectable crime tradition, of few, course. But... Few, few serial killers there. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, what, what, what does Sydney look like to you, um, in, you know, in some of the ways that we've just been talking about? Yeah, I think really interesting to hear what Chris just said. My, I, did, I was born in Sydney, but I, I grew up in Adelaide, and, um, but my, my, almost all my working life has been Sydney. And I think my working life in Sydney has seen the morph the morphing of crime being centred around what I'd call vice in the cross, like illegal gambling, um, we've still got drugs, prostitution, etc., to a different style of crime um, involving 
property development in particular, um, and also large corporate entities. And I, so when I came to Sydney, I was a very unimportant lawyer, but even as a very unimportant lawyer, I was given a uh, south east facing office on level 51 of the MLC center. And over the next four years, I moved around that building until I had the northeast corner <laughs> looking over. And this does get ingrained. The cliche gets ingrained in your head that this is Sydney, that the Opera House, the harbour, the blue of the harbour, the white sails of the boat sailing around, all that green, that magnificent topography of Sydney Harbour gets ingrained in your brain. And it took me a while to realise this uh, visually beautiful city has a real dark side. And I think for me, it started with, um, you might recall the HIH Royal Commission where HIH collapsed. Um, I, I was doing some insurance work at the time and some of these people were regarded as gods that ultimately ended up going to jail for lodging false reports as uh, uh, financial reports as directors of companies. And that was a real eye-opener to me that uh, Sydney's got this element of crime in it, even at the really upper level. And, and then I think one of the key things about Sydney and money and crime that's something that's morphed out of the cross is that there's, first of all, there's, it's hard to think of a city of 5 million people that's a major uh, metropolis that started its life as a jail. But... Um, and I think there's been, amongst police and others, a, a behavioural contagion that started in 1788 and has existed probably with the cops until the Wood Royal Commission. But, but um, there's very few other cities in the world where so close to where we are now, relatively close, there's been land surrounding Sydney in the 1950s that might have been worth £2,000, that with the stroke of a a council officer's pen or another government decision maker changing the zoning from rural to employment or industrial uses went from 2,000 pounds worth of land to by 2,000. I've seen cases and been involved in cases where land that was worth 2,000 pounds 35 years later is worth over a hundred million dollars. And that's that sort of incentive to make money is rife for corrupting people that get to make particularly planning decisions because you know we all know about real estate in Sydney um, and a lot of a lot of ICACs where ICACs getting a bad rap at the moment over Gladys uh, and un, un, perhaps an unfair rap but if you look back at the history of ICAC so much of its work has been uncovering corrupt people not necessarily in the highest levels of government like in cabinet uh, there's been a few cabinet ministers and others go to jail. We know who they are over mining, which is another form of property development. But ICAC's done so much work uncovering uh, low-level uh, planning type people in councils that have done really corrupt things. It's been a really valuable tool for that. So I think that's where I see Sydney's crime has morphed to. I'm sure there's still the, the vice and there's obviously still drugs. Um, you know, you had the 70s, the, the drugs coming in from Southeast Asia with Vietnam and whatnot. We've still got a terrible ice problem in not just Sydney, but New South Wales generally. But I, in my career, I've seen crime morph to corporate entities and a lot to do with property and the, the, the vast sums of money that can be made out of that. So it's a rich, it's a rich field for if you want to write crime fiction. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes occurred to me that the corrupt planning decisions would probably be one of the categories of crime about which we know least um, because they, they occur at the local government issue everywhere, don't they? They do, but um, there's certainly been, uh, I don't know whether people recall, it, and I can't remember exactly, and it was, it might have been 10 or 12 years ago, people at Wollongong Council got in serious trouble for being bribed by property developers for large-scale developments. And even, look, Chris mentioned casinos. Even the, the I'm not suggesting for a moment, not just because of uh, defamation laws, not suggesting for a moment there's anything corrupt in the slightest about the Crown Casino development. <laughs> but even that was done in a really strange way. It was like this invitation to, to it, was, it was not done in the open, transparent way 
that planning should be done for something that is like a 75 story building, basically in the heart of the city, right next to Sydney Harbour. That should be a fully transparent, open process where there's, if you're gonna do it, where there's tenders and whatnot. And we all know it wasn't done that way. That doesn't mean it was crook, but it does mean that it's unusual and it looks as though people with big bags of money get better access to politicians and decision makers than um, other people. Um, I just buy into that from a, uh, a Canberra point of view. So I worked on and off in the press gallery in Canberra. I first worked there in 1987 in the old Parliament House and I last worked there in um, 2017. So it's a 30 year gap. We seriously do need a federal version of ICAC. The fact that the government is so <laughs> doesn't want it will give you a good idea that maybe it's needed. And the big problem there, I mean, they're very happy at the moment with with a proposal they put forward to have public servants investigated. That's fine. A huge problem there and throughout the Australian political system is political donations. So you have to look at, say, this government in Canberra and say, are they beholden to the fossil fuel lobby? That's a pretty easy suspicion to make. Okay, prove it. Well, how? Because the, don the system of political donations is so opaque and deliberately opaque, you don't know. So if you don't know who's funding the major political parties, th that's at least, you know, uh, the potential to have corruption, to have, uh, you know, it's not the brown paper bag under the desk. It's who's who, you know, who pays the piper calls the tune sort of stuff. So I, I think we definitely need a federal body. Um, and there's, you know, fortunately all the states have these bodies. So there's plenty of models to, you know, pick and choose from. But not, not only do they, the states have models, but to your point, New South Wales ICAC has run numerous inquiries and found corrupt conduct in relation to um, uh, uh, breaking laws in relation to political donations. So it's been a really valuable tool for that. Whether, you know, without wanting to get true dramatic about this, I, I, we all know the Prime Minister said the ICAC inquiry, uh, the ICAC was behaving disgracefully in relation to the former Premier of this state. Um, you can take a view on that. Um, a sober view would be that all ICAC is doing in that is investigating whether someone who was a decision maker and had a public duty to perform had a form of conflict of interest. It's not an inquiry about whether she had a boyfriend or who the boyfriend was. It's an inquiry into whether, and this, this is just really standard stuff. And I'm not suggesting for a moment she did or she didn't have a conflict of interest. That's for someone else to decide. That's for the for the uh, Commissioner McColl to, to decide. But it's very standard stuff that we should always have available as a tool for watching over what government does, that the people who are exercising public duties, who have put their hand up, good on them, to be public officials and to be politicians, good on them for that. Thanks for your service but it comes with certain responsibilities. And if, if there is anything that looks as though it could have been a decision, whether it was conscious or unconscious, that may, may have involved some form of conflict of interest, not putting money in your pocket, but, but per, per, perhaps favouring someone, then that needs to be looked into as to whether that's happened or not. That's really standard. That's not disgraceful. That's just what an investigative body like that does. And, and of course, as I said before, it's done so much other good work, but what, as Chris has pointed out, all we have in the Commonwealth is the Auditor General's Office, which is fantastic, but underfunded. Um, and so we don't have this body that, for example, can look into the issue about whether $660 million worth of car parks for certain seats, Commonwealth seats, is only pork barrelling or is in fact i'm not saying it is but it should be looked into a misuse of public money and we should have an organization 
an investigative body that can do that. And it, frankly, it's a no brainer. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I mean, no, I was just interested. Anyone disagree? In the report that's just come out on sexual harassment in, in Parliament House in Canberra, I just, one of the minor details was that apparently a lot of the alcohol, which apparently is to blame for all this, is provided to ministers' offices by lobbyists, which I thought was amazing. Not a lot, maybe some of it. Some of it is provided by lobbyists. So it's even at that very basic level, like why would not, not bottles of Grange? No, no. Why would a minister's office? What were they thinking? Why would you accept, you know, a gift of alcohol from anyone, let alone a lobbyist? Anyway, we shall move on. Um, I'd like to ask both of you now about the careers that you have given your um, your main characters: journalist, lawyer. They are obvious advantages. <laughs> Obvious advantages to this, you know, if you're not going to have, if you're not going to have a cop or a private eye, um, psychologists are quite popular these days. I mean, basically anyone with a license to snoop is useful if you're writing a crime novel. But having said that, would you mind just reflecting a little bit, both of you, first you, Chris, on the advantages of the choice of a journalist, but also how you depicted his work, whether, is there a lot about being a journalist you actually had to keep out of that, as well as the bits where it was useful? I am, um, I'm just trying to unpack it, but yeah, look, the one thing for me to, to write, so my character in the first three books, the main protagonist is Martin Scarston. He's a journalist. He's, he's not me because he's um, emotionally, he's, he's, he's rather damaged. More, more damaged. Um, <laughs> but it was something on you. So, so, and, and Michael's exactly right. A journalist, you have a license to snoop. I can ring someone up and say, hey, my name's Chris Hammer and I'm just really interested in what you're doing about this. And you just say, sod off. If I ring up and say, I'm Chris Hammer and I'm from the City Morning Herald, well, you might still tell me to get lost, but, but there's no idea that you don't have the rights to do that. So a journalist, it was something I knew uh, there's some problems with it. So if you're a police officer, you can get a search warrant and search someone's property. You can arrest people, you can detain them, you can interview them, journalists. But, but you will notice, of course, there's been some very good investigative journalism in Australia over the years. You think of Four Corners in particular, the Age Investigative Unit, whatever. Um, Interestingly, though, my most recent book, uh, Treasure and Dirt, that's just come out, has got a, two new protagonists and they're both detectives. So for me, that was a, that's new ground and it's something I don't know. I never, there were times, you know, when I dealt with police as a journalist, but I was never a crime reporter as such. And I had a bit of trepidation about, about that because going from a world that I knew, the journalism world, um, there were various reasons why I, di I didn't want to continue on with, with, with Martin at, at that point. And I thought, well, if I have another journalist, though, it will just be kind of like Martin Scarsden light. So that's, and the story itself lent itself to police officers. And uh, I, did, I did speak to a retired detective, but that was more about some of the minor stuff, you know carrying guns, what sort of ID you have, what, what, what the process is, say, to get a search warrant. And what I realised after a while is you don't need to be that accurate. And in fact, you don't want to be that accurate because there's a lot about real life police investigations, say murder investigations, that are really complex. They're rather boring. For example, you, you could have a, a team of 20 or 25 detectives on a high profile case. Try putting it in a book, you never keep up with the characters. They're often working more than one case at a time. And, and a big point is this, when, when they have to look after such things as chains of evidence, because always they're thinking what's going to be admissible in court? How do we build the case? Typically in a crime fiction book, the end of the book is when they catch the perpetrator. You find out who did it. That's the end of the story. In the real world, that's kind of like the half-time whistle for police because then they've got to 
get the conviction, right? So it's it's actually so you want to get the sort of impression of uh, authenticity, a very similitude, but it's actually not. And in the same way, it's the same with the journalistic books. You know, Martin Skarsten is off in his small town for a week or more doing stories. Most journalists just don't have that luxury. I was very privileged as a journalist to, to have be able to spend that sort of time on, on stories when I was with the Bulletin and when I was with, um, with Dateline overseas. But there's a whole lot in, in those books too that isn't completely accurate. So it's, it's sort of like you want the sense, but not necessarily all the boring details. Interesting, Richard. Um, just before I, I do my bit, I was, one thing I, I did want to ask Chris though, about the, particularly the number of um, journalists or former journalists of which you're one that have become successful crime writers was has there ever been a sense of being i'm going to turn to fiction because i'm so frustrated by the laws of defamation that <laughs> that now i can Ab abs look, absolutely right, it yeah. is it is um it's not the main reason but my yeah, first three books are set in fictional towns so the mayor can be corrupt right but what happens if you set it in a real town sydney's fine because it's so big you know you can have a you know, a, a, some sort of captain of industry is corrupt or something. Well, that's fine because there's thousands of them here, not identifying something. But no, no. Um, yeah. And the other thing is, as a journalist, you can, in that kind of true crime, you don't always get to resolve things. You don't know who did it in the end. I mean, what really did happen to Bonita Nielsen? What yeah. did happen to William Tyrrell? Well, in a crime book, you can you can finalise. But yeah, I, I think the, part the reason of it, I asked is yeah. if, if you can hold my book up for a second. <laughs> this is this is my first non-fiction book. The defamation report slightly larger than that for for this book, which I found a really interesting process. Is I I did a profile once uh, for SBS, a whole story on the guy who's the head of Telstra called Sultra Hio. Yeah, and I and I travelled to Supermix. And I travelled to the United States and traced his corporate history. And he, and he was up to all sorts of things. But it was a problematic story because he was known to be uh, litigious, had been in the United States, had uh, all of Telstra's corporate lawyers at his disposal. Um, they hired outside QCs and that. Kind of, I remember sitting in on the phone on a bad phone line from Islamabad, there'd been a terrorist attack and a major earthquake, and I was there on a phone for four hours, you know, going, you know, this is at the end of the States, just crossing to, you know, revoicing little bits, just, just for one word difference. I mean, the defamation laws in Australia are really oppressive. Yeah. Having reported in the, in the United States, it is, you know, the constitutional well, it's a, it's right to free speech. Test. It's is, a different test for public. A to it is. For public yes, that's, that's right. It is difficult, though. It is, a, uh, and there are moves to reform, but there have been moves to reform for years. There's differences between jurisdictions. So people say, how do I find writing crime fiction compared to journalism? I find it liberating. <laughs> I can just make shit up. <laughs> but but don't you, even, one of the things you said is 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 itself even for fiction a problem even for fiction is that you didn't you you were hesitant to set a scene in a real town where you you wanted to call a mayor corrupt even if yep. you could have had a different gender yep. like everything about that character but a lawyer would still have said ah oh, I don't know about this so, uh, so, so in 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 my recent book the one that's just come out, Treasure and Dirt, it's set in an opal mining town. It's very hard scrabble. But there are a couple of big, colourful mining billionaires. And if you're thinking, if you're thinking in Australia, um, how do people get really mega rich? You know, if you set the book in America, they'd be tech billionaires, right? But in Australia, well, there's property and there's mining. But if you read the book, you're not going to see 
some sort of thinly veiled depiction of Gina Reinhardt or um, uh, Twiggy Forrest yeah. or Clive Palmer or that. And they are, I mean, these are larger than life people. It's kind of tempting, but, it, but no, I'm not going to go anywhere near that. Well, but you, so you won't be able to see any of those, except they're really wealthy miners. That's about all they've got in common. Well, so my first crime book sign, I gaze games with a, <laughs> would you believe it, a barrister as the protagonist. Uh, uh, I has a corrupt mining company, but I, I made them Chinese and South African to avoid the, <laughs> no, no disrespect to, uh, it wasn't a, a racial thing. It was just, it was literally to avoid what you're just talking about. So uh, I've written two novels, crime novels, around a criminal barrister called Peter Tanner. Um, the reason I did that is, first of all, as a writer, uh, I'm very time poor. It's not, my, it's not my job. My job is as a barrister, and my job as a barrister can be incredibly intense and long hours. I've mentioned the Murray-Darling Royal Commission. That was... God knows, 12 to 16 hours a day for a year. And last year I did, you know, I was special, um, a senior counsel in inquiry into the Ruby Princess. Um, and that was equally long hours, 14 to 18 hours a day for month after month, which means you're not writing fiction when you're doing that. So uh, the small amounts of time available to me to write fiction, I've really got to pick what I know because if I spend time doing research, I'm not going to be doing any writing at all. So I'm not a criminal barrister, but I've always wanted to be one. So I chose to create this criminal barrister um, uh, as like a, a, a de facto me being a, a, a Sydney's best criminal defence attorney. Um, I also have always, as a lawyer, wanted to behave in a disgraceful way and break the rules and I never have. So I've, I've uh, set this barrister who probably should have been struck off four or five times at least, uh, but always for reasons that you won't hate him for, you'll understand why he's doing it. Um, so I've, I've had, I've had a, lot, a lot of fun with him and the, the books surround the sort of themes that we've, we've spoken about today. Cyanide Games involves a, uh, a, a, um, corrupt uh, mining company, um, and it is still necessary to say that first word, corrupt, a corrupt mining company that um, uh, wants to um, develop some mines in Australia but is trying to cover up an uh, environmental disaster in, a, in another country. Um, and that's um, work I'm familiar with as, a, as an environment and planning lawyer. Um, I've done <laughs> work for both mining companies and for environmental groups. So that's familiar to me. Um, and the, the other book, uh, Burden of Lies, is with the same character, uh, involves corrupt property deals. Um, again, as a planning lawyer, very familiar to me. Uh, and when I say property deals, we're talking really, really huge developments of the kind, I think, that's in trust in some ways. Um, and so I've, I've had a lot of fun with him because he is both with his clients and sometimes with the court and sometimes with, a, with opponents, far more daring and far more rude than I ever, ever am. So I get to live in this de facto life I have through him, through those two books. So it's been a lot of fun for me. And, and can I ask you, I made the assertion that, 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 that with me, I'm, I'm trying for the feel of authenticity rather than actually be authentic. So the way, the way your character works is not, as a lawyer, yeah, that, that's a good. I, I wanted to say something about what you said about it not having to be like absolutely accurate. It, it does, and I think I read um, an interview with Michael Connolly when he was talking about one of the Lincoln lawyer, Lincoln lawyer novels, who's a, a lawyer in LA, where he said it doesn't have to be absolutely accurate. In fact, being absolutely accurate can be an impediment. It just has to be just believable enough, yeah. and that's that's what you that's what I've aimed for with Peter Tanner. That he's just believable enough in terms of what he does outside the court to prepare for crime because he acts a bit like a private investigator <laughs> and he's not a yeah. barrister and uh, just believable enough in court too. Uh, I'm probably a little bit more of a stickler for, for the rules of evidence because it is my, my background, but yeah, just believable enough. Clive James said that fiction is non-fiction with the boring bits taken out. So... <laughs> <laughs>
Um, on that note, I've, I've allowed this to go disgracefully over time, but we've still got about 10 minutes for questions. So please, um, any questions here? Yes, down the back. Would you mind standing up to ask it? And I'll, I'll repeat it once I get an idea of what it is. We're not using microphones for COVID reasons. Well, thanks for that. Um, I probably couldn't publish it today because um, because of its attempt to understand a different culture. But anyway, we won't go there. Um, did everyone hear that question? So why is most Sydney crime, fictional crime set in the, in the goat cheese triangle? Um, anyone like to try and answer that? Uh, there, are, there are a couple. Um, Michael Brissenden's books are set in the West and has, has that kind of crime, drug, gangs, sort of, you know, uh, Lakemba, Western Sydney elements to them. I think maybe Tim Ailiff to an extent too, but I, t I take your point and, it, and with me, I mean, I'm an outsider, but I was deliberately not going to do the harbour bit, but it is absolutely in a city, yeah. It's a, good, it's a good point though. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the answer to your question is generally amongst all writers. I can only say that I haven't gotten to that yet. I'm, I'm still, I've, I've done, I've done I've done mining companies and I've done big property developers. Maybe I'll get to, to something one day along the lines you're talking of. But I, I think it's it, it would be something that you'd... You, I mean, we talked about not having to be accurate, but just believable enough. I think if you're doing a crime novel that, that's gritty and set in the West and, uh, and involves drug gangs, etc., I think you'd really have needed to do your homework to write that sort of book. So you'd, you'd have to spend... I think it, it's not... It's not fantasy fiction. That's stuff you may have had to have lived or know, know a lot about, whether it's growing up there or as a journalist or whatever. Um, okay, another question, please. Okay, so the question is, is to what extent do the characters here embody the city in which they're operating? Um, yeah, Richard referred for to Michael Connolly. Um, I've interviewed him a couple of times because we have the same publisher here in Australia. And he said, and so he's the author of the Harry Bosch books and the Mickey Huller books and the Jack McAvoy books. And he says, every time before he starts writing, and they're all set in Los Angeles, he, he, he reads Raymond Chandler's chapter 13 in The Big Sleep. And I go, what, what happens? He goes, oh, nothing happens. He just, and I think it's Marla, is that right? He just drives around Los Angeles and it's a description of the city. And I think it's sort of, for Michael, it's kind of setting his mood as he's writing. So what I was saying before about setting and how it's like this world that you're creating for the reader, then the characters, particularly your protagonists, your point of view characters, need to inhabit that world and kind of need to reflect it too. Um, they're often a bit flawed. They're often like a bit of a maverick because, you know, as Richard's saying at times, you need them to sort of bend the rules, like, you know, sort of getting a warrant, just breaking in, you know, that sort of thing happens all the time in crime books. But in the end, as the reader enters the book, enters the world, the person who's guiding them are these point of view characters so it's very important that they reflect the world because you don't want, you know, you don't, you want it to be an immersive experience. And so you don't want there to be a conflict or a contradiction there. So it, it's very important, I think. Um, on the Philip Marlowe point, I'm a huge fan and um, I hope my character Peter Tanner is both funny and biting and dry and all of that is is a is a total influence from Raymond Chandler or even the way my character acts as a PI as well as a barrister is probably influenced by that in terms of knowing the city uh, Peter Tanner didn't come from a privileged background um, uh, his father went to prison for a fraud um, which is probably why he became a criminal defense attorney his wife's died, he's a sole parent, and he's worked his way up from the bottom of the criminal bar to the top. And in doing that, you, you become intimately aware of Sydney and how it operates because he started with um, 
uh, acting for low-level criminals and low-level drug addicts and worked his way up to the drug lords and the white-collar criminals. So he's, got, he's had a fantastic education in every layer of Sydney. Great, thanks very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there because we're out of time. Um, in a minute, when we finish and leave the room, um, and this has got something to do with the unusual layout of the library, I'm going to have to take our two guests straight back to the bookstore, which is on the other side of the library. Um, so I'd ask if you want to have a chat to them, you're welcome to do it, but would you mind following us over there? I know it's a little inconvenient, but um, we have got a signing arranged there, which we want to do reasonably soon. So thank you very much for coming and can you please join me in congratulating and thanking our guests. <laughs>